tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is actress, artist, Moon Unit Zappa and artistic director of Fuego Flamenco, Roberta Amaral. Even though Moon Zappa moved from New York to California when she was an infant, she considers herself a New Yorker. <laughs> she went to a private school on the west side and by the time she was 14, everything changed. What happened, Moon? Uh, that's when uh, Valley Girl uh, happened, which was a song that I did, and uh, it, it uh, took off, and at that time uh, I suddenly was making more money than the teachers who were on staff <laughs> at the school I was attending, and uh, so it was incredibly awkward to be uh, in, that, in that situation, and so shortly thereafter I, I uh, took the GED and, and left school and then just started pursuing whatever what's the GED interests. oh it's uh, the the equivalency exam it's 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 a uh, so you get your your high school diploma it's it's the test that that you take and then did you go to uh, college after that no I just I just started taking acting classes language classes art classes whatever kind of classes uh, interested me and and uh, <laughs> did you feel did you feel that you missed out on your childhood by leaving um, school at 14 well, the funny thing is, is I take so many classes now that um, maybe I, I do feel that in some way because I just I love I love that um, I, I just love that that setup. I love to to be in a situation where you can just keep absorbing information and, and knowledge. Maybe that's, that's useful. A, <laughs> maybe that's a different thing because mm -hmm. when you go to college, everyone says, "Oh, you missed the best part of your life. You missed the social part." Mm -hmm. They don't say that you're learning very much, right? Because they think when when you you're mature enough, mm -hmm. then you can take what you're saying, things that you really feel yeah. are helpful. I, I heard a theory they were talking about uh, on the radio, they are talking about how, how they think that uh, school should be structured more so that people can uh, take time off when they want to take time off and then go back to school when they want to learn. That way it encourages people to actually absorb what is what is offered in the, in the school systems. I think that that is a good idea mm -hmm. if it can happen. I think <laughs> <laughs> the way things happen they never happen. What else can we solve here yes, today? <laughs> I don't think we can. When you were um, going to school on the west side the story was about being a valley girl. Were you living in the valley or uh, were you just uh, no, I was, close to those uh, girls? I, I went to school with, a, with uh, several people who lived there and uh, I went to so many bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs when I was at that age because that's that's when the, the boys become men and the girls become women. <laughs> um, and so uh, I, uh, I just spent a lot of time in, in Encino and Tarzana in that area. <laughs> and then, of course, for, for any kind of social activity, you live in a mall. You just go and plant yourself in some mall somewhere and play video games or just, you know, check out the guys or... Oh, <laughs> but I do think <laughs> I wouldn't do that time over for any amount of money. My sister's 14 now, and I just watch. I go, oh. Is she doing that now, or has um, things changed? Have things changed? Uh, well, it's it's definitely. Uh, the, it seems to me that there are more opportunities to take that stuff at home. Like she's just got every video game imaginable, um, and, and the, the house is sort of set up where, where she lives uh, for her to be able to. It's like a, just a, a center where she can just do all that kind of stuff. You come from a really close knit family, mm -hmm. so did they uh, approve of leaving school early and um, hanging out at the mall? <laughs> it, it, it all sort of just happened so quickly and just and sort of just uh, turned into that. So it was just uh, like a speeding train and just kind of go with it. So. Well, well then, did you start acting, or did you start singing with you? Uh, your brother had a band, right? Or well, he did has your a two band. brothers. My two brothers have a band, and uh, and uh, I mean, my singing. I, I never really did did much singing, just little things here and there. And um, Valley Girl was to me it was more of a character that I did, and uh, just, just so it was acting. Really. Yeah, it was a it was acting. So then, did you have a big break? In, um, in your acting career? <laughs> uh, yes, um, I got to do an episode of Chips. That was the first job I had. Um, no, uh, yes, that's how I got my uh, my SAG card. But uh, I haven't had my, uh, I guess, my official big break. But I mean, I've I've done lots of 
television stuff and you uh, had a show with your brother film stuff yeah I had a show called normal life it was with Max Gale and Cindy Williams that was a, a few years back that was my uh, my taste of um, thespian penitentiary. But and, now uh, <laughs> we have a film that's out, or a film uh, yeah. that's um, a film, yeah, a I big did. film. I did a film. It's called The Dark Side of Genius. It's with Finola Hughes, and it's due for release this uh, later this year. And I have a I have a little clip from it, a scene, a scene from that. Tell us about your character, and we'll show um, it. Well, the story is that she's uh, she's a um, like an art critic, and she falls in love with this artist's paintings, and uh, he apparently had murdered his girlfriend, who's the subject of all these paintings. And I'm her roommate, who uh, forbids her to have anything to do with this guy because even though he's a brilliant artist, he's he's insane. So, well, we're going to see that clip. Yeah. Then we're going to come back to a brilliant artist, Moon Zappa, with another career. Thank so you. We'll see that. Not the one with the particular odor. Thank you. You know, I thought when we had him neutered that he'd give up all this male aggression. You know, he doesn't have any balls. He should behave accordingly. Ew. Julian John. Julian John. My name rings a bell. Did I have sex with him? Please, ma'am. In his organization of material to his deep primal urges. Do we have any ammonia? What's that? How's magic in the daisies? You're in love with me. <laughs> was it difficult working with an English actress? Uh, no, uh, Finola is, uh, she's just so easy to work with and she's such a, a funny, sweet person. She's uh, very easygoing. I, I didn't, uh, I didn't like really pay attention to the fact that she was English. <laughs> 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 and then not to alarm the people, that last little clip was not in the film. That last little thing was, uh, was is a character that I do. Oh, is um, that you? On yeah, it's, oh. it's me. I've got this like funny hood on and it's a character that I do called the Wood Elf and it, it really, it makes my brothers laugh so that's why I, I stuck that thing on. Do you it. use it any other time? Um, for an outgoing messages on my answering machine. <laughs> <laughs> what about stand-up? Have you ever done stand-up No, I, I never have. You it's, can be the Wood Elf. I Sure. Yeah, the Wood Elf has lots to say, lots to talk about. <laughs> Is the Wood Elf uh, an artist? Um, no, the Wood Elf actually hypnotizes people and then commands them to do things that the Wood Elf does not want to actually do. So oh, it's, a, it's actually a sub-personality, Joan, and it's when I can't, uh, when I don't want to take responsibility for uh, manipulating humans, I, um, I turn into the Wood Elf. It is a great character. <laughs> I think you can do that very well. Did, uh, <laughs> did you take responsibility for your art? How did that all start? Um, actually, yeah, I, uh, the, the way all this stuff came about was um, I had uh, no money and I had a, a birthday uh, present to uh, create for someone and I had to, so I just started making something and I, I just pictured her and I just put my affection for her into this thing and, and, and it just sort Is of grew right? from there. And uh, they're, I call them sacred objects because they're sacred to me, but I, I really like um, the shape of crosses, for example. So I've, I've done, uh, their, their, their prayers and their, their entities and their, um, their blessings. It's, I, I go through uh, pretty much of an ordeal when I'm making these things because I'm Let, really... Let's talk about the sacred... Um this, this the sacred one. person next to you. Yeah, this this little uh, this is actually an, an entity. This is um, this is me uh, worrying that I won't have money. And so what I've done is I've I've put that terror and fear into um, <laughs> into this little creature. And Where this do is you? My, oh, and that's the my, back. <laughs> this is my little creature. You had so. a show at Robert Berman Gallery. Actually, no, it's, it's coming up. The the, um, the actually, well, this, this right. will be on at that time. The from through August at the Robert Berman Gallery. But he'll, um, he's had your your work up yeah, there he's because had it I've there. seen your mm -hmm. work there. So he continues to have your right. work in Santa Monica. Exactly. Uh, where do you find the pieces? Uh, I usually um, I collect. Um, they're called um, what the heck are they called? Those little things. They're called relics. That's what they are, and they're they're just. Uh, I f some people you call say, these buttons relics. No, these <laughs> things. These little things. Um, yeah. I have, and actually, I don't think there are any on these pieces. I have. Well, this is a little thing. This, somebody brought this back from South America for me. But um, when I was in France, I collected all these things that will have like a piece of a saint's clothing or mm. a piece of their bone or tooth or something. Saint. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but um, somebody deemed them as such. And 
and uh, so it's just things that people have either given me or, or I, I like to find old uh, kimono fabrics or things that, that you can't that you can't uh, uh, have a, a copy of and then put the pieces together. The piece behind you is a little bit different from yeah. um, th these doll-like figures. Mm -hmm. What what does that depict? This actually is a bracelet that I made, uh. and uh, I I studied. Uh, I mean, just with my own my own. Did you make it before you decided to have a show, or were oh you yeah, making no, it along I was just way? I was just making these things to please myself. Oh, these, I see. These, this was a bracelet I made. I had looked at how Indian bracelets are 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 done, and I. Just just uh, looked at how, how that was put together, and I just sort of—it's actually a bracelet. So it's, I just um, I hung it up there. Did you ever wear it? Um, no, I never did. So now, and and that's the signature on the bottom. Yep, I, I make little uh, name placards. What's it placards. made out of? Basically, same thing. Yeah, it's just fabrics and beads um, collected from really all over the planet, wherever you know. From these, it's got a lot of Italian and and South American beads and some some Indian ones. We're back again to this yeah. piece, which looks like it's a concrete block. Yeah, I just found a little piece of cement and I just um, just painted it. I just, I like collecting things and just... Do you do that a lot? Is, yeah. your, is your room filled with these kind of things? Yeah, uh, you know, for some reason I um, I just I just love I love anything that's got that. Co I, I was raised without any kind of religion, so I uh, I automatically gravitate towards anything that's. Uh, Isn't that strange yeah. the way that happens? Mm -hmm. And my my very favorite thing is to if I'm visiting like churches or temples and stuff like that. I love to look at the architecture because I I really believe that there are messages literally planted in the in the architecture, especially like when you think about the the postures or mudras that that the the saints or whoever they're whatever like Buddha he's got this thing and, right. and Mary's like this if you if you assume those those postures I really believe that there's information left in that in that uh, in that um, in that position for some reason and with crosses one thing that I've noticed is um, it seems to me in the Catholic Church they the this part of the cross is um, sort of it doesn't divide the uh, it doesn't divide it in half. It se separates it into two uneven parts, which to right. me is like the heart from the heart up. And then in, in uh, American Indian, uh, the, their, their, the shape of their cross, it's d directly in the in center. In the center, right. And then uh, in, in um, like I have an Ethiopian cross, and it's it's on the lower half, and it's it's just interesting to me where they where they make the division and uh, the Ethiopian crosses are beautiful. Mm -hmm. When we were in Jerusalem, we went up and saw the Ethiopian mm -hmm. priests. They were, were on top of a, an old church, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh -huh. and they were carving these little crosses and selling them in in the store. They were beautiful. But also, the Orthodox cross has a another little slash through it. Oh, really? Yeah, you'll have to look into oh, that. Oh, that's very interesting. When do you travel? Travel a lot. I try to. I, l I love to travel. Do yeah. you? Mm -hmm. Where do you pick up things as you go? Yeah, along? everywhere. Little little um, markets. I love going to just uh, old, um, you know, the, the local flea markets of little towns or wherever you are, just to, to see the stuff. Are you have. disciplined about working? Do you have a set time? Um, I'm actually experimenting with time management right now. <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure um, what my best hour of the day is. Um, I mean, I really, I'm experimenting. Sometimes I'll just stay up all night. Sometimes I'll actually schedule in a nine to to six kind of a, a setup for myself. Do you frame these things yourself? Because I see there's I have fabrics this, on the inside of yeah, some of these frames. Um, this is old Victorian fabric that I, I found in, in a little place that I love here in, in Los Angeles called La Maison du Bol. So it's a little place off of Melrose and they, uh, they have all these um, just you can get all kinds of really cool stuff, but um, I have this great framer. His name is Ray at this place called Options, and I just take the stuff in there and well, I tell him he, what I want to do, and he puts the things together. And um, so, so it's, it's all Moon Unit Zappa, the whole thing. Yeah, is I, you. from from beginning to end. <laughs> and we're at our end. <laughs> ah. <laughs> that was fast. Thanks very much for being with Thank us. Thank you so much for having me and on And I'm the so show. happy to have these the first time on the air. Yeah, this is, this is all new. <laughs> Thanks for being with us. And don't go away because we have Roberto Amaral coming on next. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with artistic director and principal dancer of Fuego Flamenco 
Roberto Amaral. Roberto started his professional career at 17 and has achieved worldwide acclaim as a dancer, choreographer, singer, and composer. From 1966 to 1976, he toured Europe with many of the top Spanish ballets, dancing with Jose Greco, Antonio, and Alberto Lorca. He's made many appearances on television and in 1981 received an Emmy for the Linda Carter Celebration. How did you earn an Emmy for that? Well, she decided to do something that had a flamenco theme and Walter Painter, who was hired as the uh, choreographer, decided to hire me as flamenco consultant, ah. so we collaborated on doing uh, a suite of flamenco dances for her special. He's fabulous, Walter yeah, Painter. Yeah, it was he a lot used, of fun. He used to take ballet class over at <laughs> Tanya Lachine's, so I used to see him all the time. Yeah, he was a lot of fun to work with. So yeah. he knew just to go to the right person. I, I, he got my name from someone, I don't know who, but uh, somebody recommended me and we hooked up and and worked on the special for about three months. Is that right? Tell me, or tell our audience, tell us all what flamenco really is. How do you define flamenco dancing? Well, it's really hard to pigeonhole flamenco as an art form because it encompasses so many different um, aspects of different cultures from all around the world. Uh, it takes a little bit from the cultures of um, uh, Egypt. The hand movements are very Middle Eastern. Uh, the foot movements uh, are very much influenced by the foot movements of Indian dancing, Hindu dancing. Mm. And um, so it really encompasses many different cultures. Of course, it's, it's the art form that's, um, that belongs to the gypsies of, so of southern Spain, the region known as Andalusia. And that's where this melting pot took place of all these different cultures. Uh, because we always think of flamenco as being Spanish. Well, it is Spanish. Uh, it began in Spain. That's where it originated. Where they put everything together. Everything you mean together, pieces? exactly. Were they all living together? I would imagine. Then yes, they lived in these the Moors and the Arabs. And, uh, of course, the mm -hmm. gypsies that live in the southern part of Spain, uh, many of their ancestors are Moorish and, uh, and Arabic. Oh, so that's where they get all these influences. And along with the Spanish uh, folk melodies and rhythms that existed in Spain, all of this kind of swirled around together and flamenco actually was born a little over a hundred years ago. Does it, is it always the same or is there like contemporary flamenco or a hundred year old yeah. flamenco or how does it work? Well it changes. Every, it? every 10 or 15 years it has sort of a, a, a rebirth you know and new forms of, of the art form kind of shoot off and we're, we're very much, flamencos are very much influenced by all the other things that are happening in the world as far as dance and music, the progression of and uh, the um, all the new innovative uh, musical and dance forms that take place. So whenever something uh -huh. new comes along, of course flamenco is going to be influenced by it and the, and the flamenco dancers and musicians are going to pick up on these new forms of uh, arranging music and arranging dance and that's why it takes it takes on a different shape every 10 or 15 years or so as music changes and progresses. So uh, you as an artistic director would put your stamp on what you're teaching as a the core or the choreography you would put this is right. a Roberto Amaral step or something of that nature? Well yes we all have there's a vocabulary of movement that we all kind uh -huh. of learn when we first start dancing uh, and then from there we kind of take, What is it? Well kind of? <laughs> there are there are steps there are traditional steps that are done with the feet there are traditional rhythms that are done with the hands and traditional movements that are done with the entire body, turns and poses and what have you. But Those always remain. Those always remain. And then from there, because uh, most flamenco dancers not only um, study flamenco or dance flamenco, they're always somehow touched by other dance forms or they've been exposed to mm. other forms of dance, modern, ballet, jazz, awesome. uh, different uh, world dance forms. So because of that, uh, especially in, in my case, I studied many different kinds of dance. So when I do flamenco, the influences from the other dance forms just come out naturally. Well, it's is something it that pure? Is it still pure? It's still pure because it's <laughs> flamenco and we're still dancing in rhythms that are pure flamenco. I see. And uh, we're keeping most of the movements traditional, mm -hmm. but occasionally we may throw a modern arm movement or we may uh -huh. throw a hip movement in that is something that maybe wasn't done 50 years ago that has changed. I see. I you see. Know. Now, your, your background is South American and... 
Yes, Mexican and Brazilian. And Brazilian yeah. and, and Mexican. Yeah. Um, do you think you have to be a Latin to be able to dance this? Is it in your blood? How, do you, how would you learn it? Well, you don't necessarily have to be Latin. It just has to be in your blood. <laughs> yeah, it has to be in your blood. Um, <laughs> Because there are a lot of non-Latins that have uh, devoted their lives to flamenco and have become very successful at, at performing flamenco. So it just has to be somewhere in your blood. You have to feel it to be able to perform it well. You can always learn it technically well, but if you don't have that aire, is what we call the, the, the essence of flamenco uh, in your soul, in your body, uh, it will always look kind of generic and it'll never have that... Uh. that spice that it needs to have in order to reach the audiences and the masses and are also to go deep within someone's soul and heart. When you're seeing it, you have to feel it the way we're dancing it. I see. You have to be able to feel that. I saw the performance that you did at the Fountain, um, Fountain Theater. Yes. And you're the in-house dance... Company, yeah. Company. Sort of in-house residence. dance, resident dance company there. But what I noticed, you talked about classical movements. There are uh, several classical, or maybe they're not classical, but accessories. Mm -hmm. Now, the shawl behind you, mm -hmm. every woman who came out had a shawl. What does that mean, and why, how do they use it? Well, shawls have always been something that the gypsy women have used, you know. And we're not talking just Spanish gypsies. We're talking Hungarian gypsies, Yugoslavian, mm -hmm. Russian gypsies. They always used some kind of a shawl or uh, cover uh, as a wrap. And uh, <laughs> this has somehow taken on its own little uh, um, uh, quirkiness in flamenco. Uh, they, they have now used them as props in dancing. Mm. So they, they went from using the shawl as just uh, a part of their apparel, their everyday wear, to actually using it as a prop and uh, creating space, creating uh, designs, creating different... Um, different nuances with the shawl while they're dancing. And the fan which you brought? Yes, the fan is something that of course just the women use. Um, it's not only used in classical Spanish dance but now it's used in flamenco as well. I would say over the last oh, 50 or 60 years of flamenco it was incorporated in dances. The other day you used the cane. Right. No, I don't know if there was any music with it but you picked no, up the cane. Pick up the, pick up the cane and you just yeah, right. Tapped rhythms out on the floor. And then you did your feet with it. Exactly. It's sort of uh, what a drummer would do. Uh, drummers use their foot to play the bass drum, the kick drum, and then they'll use their hands to play different patterns on other drums. So I basically do patterns with my foot, and then I do uh, counter patterns or uh, polyrhythmic patterns with the uh, cane as well. And show so us the boots, the because, boots the, be, because the stomping came from these right, heels. The heels, exactly. <laughs> these are traditional. No taps. No, not, not taps, but we do have nails. Oh, yeah. Instead yeah. of taps, uh, the flamenco shoes have nails that are pounded in one at a time so that they cover the entire surface of the heel and of the toe, creating uh, a metal-like almost hammerhead. And ah. uh, so when we hit the floor, it has a more solid sound than a tap would, because taps jingle when they ah, hit the floor. So and they, these, they, they move they move. A little bit. And so these uh, give more the effect of a hammer hitting the floor. I see. So the, the, ha the, the uh, heel and the cane together gave you a, your the rhythm. Of the rhythm. Your percussion. Right. Now, is it just... <laughs> I shouldn't be asking you this, but it looks like people just doing a bunch of stomping in one place. Are there steps? <laughs> oh, there are a lot of steps, yeah. Like I say, there is a vocabulary of movement that we learn when we're first studying. And there are many basic steps, but from there we can create many different variations we're by changing a heel or a toe and adding this or that. You know. We're going to see some performance at the Fountain Theater right now. You brought a clip mm -hmm. for us. Play us in with your castanets and we'll do the... Uh, We'll, we'll see the uh, clip from the Fountain Theater. Okay, the castanets, um, there are a few flamenco dances that incorporate castanets, but castanets are mostly used in classical Spanish dancing. Uh -huh. So we have a... So let's just see the clip. <laughs> Thank you. 
de noche me abraza lo que vale son tu brazo cuanto de noche me abraza I was feeling the groove. You were, Joan. Okay. I want you to play these castanets. <laughs> I can't play them. I've always wanted to play castanets. Tell me, in your opinion, who you think the greatest flamenco dancer uh, of our time. Of our time? Carmen Amaya. Uh, she <sighs> died about 30 years ago, but she was a legend. And I don't think every, anybody has ever really come up to her standard uh, as far as capturing the true essence of, of the gypsy style of dance. Ah, Carmen yeah. Amaya. Carmen Amaya. We want to thank you for being with us. We want to thank Roberto. We want to thank all of you for watching. We want you to keep writing to us. We love your letters. 520 South Grand, 8th floor, 971 Los Angeles. And I'm going to have Roberto play us out. I can't oh. do it. <laughs> Bye. See you next time.